Okay, so today I think we will make a really big event. It you know, looks like I'm running for president. Okay, <laughs> I just came to the classroom to talk to a few people and to share what I have gone through for the last 30 years. So uh, this slide shows uh, strength in numbers. So I began my practice in 1986, right after I went to medical school. Uh, in 30 years, I have gone through a lot. I have have a lot of patients and probably have made a lot of mistakes. And some minor, some major. Sometimes people forgive me and then I don't have to pay any price. And some I had to pay a higher price. But it's a good lesson. And it's a So we're trying to make a good practice in California or probably in the whole world. We know I want to really work, but you also should know cost and risk do exist. I know you will take some classes about management, you know, like the ethics, the law, and regulations. You will learn so much more in the future. And then I want to use this class to give you some highlights. So no matter what you do, or uh, you know, uh, how you want to do uh, entrepreneur in the future, as long as you want to run a practice, or if you want to be part of a group practice, you should keep those, you know, items on your mind. In order to make a profitable practice, you should look the cost. Yeah, the, so the cost, I have at least, uh, probably not limited, but I think major cost are covered here. If it's very practical, then you will see everything in your near future. So we try to take a cost as low as possible in order to make some profit because we can help people. So there are many risks you probably will I go through, uh, you probably will encounter uh, legal, ethical, and professional. So legal, ethical, professional, those three common things you will probably have to avoid in the future when you practice. To keep simple, make sure you don't do anything illegal. <laughs> And make sure you can do even better, make sure everything ethical. Improve your knowledge, you know, improve your knowledge and improve your skills and make sure you look a true professional. I've been teaching at five branches for about 20 years and I see the trend at five branches. We are getting more and more serious about this medicine and we are becoming more professional. But we can be more professional, we can always be better. My unique description for the profession is either bad or better or best. There is no good practice, only better or best. So first I want to give you guys an introduction about the business code. What you learn from five branches from other school is never enough. So now you have so much accessibility to internet and then you can learn many, many new things. So a lot of people don't know what they can do or we cannot do. So my team has seen me prescribing a lot of x-ray orders okay, okay, and okay. imaging tests. So and then I have been teaching here for many years and in all my classes, master level or doctor level, I always encourage my students or my associates to improve their clinical skills and use the technology available and all their the imaging tests you deserve If you're in doctoral program, you're to be you're going to be a specialist in the future. If you don't know how to order or when you when you should order an X-ray or some other imaging test, I think it doesn't make you look good enough. But there's confusion in our profession. That, oh, you cannot order X-ray because you are not an MD. Because the radiology center told me you're not qualified. Okay, so. In California, we are likely the primary, provi a primary care provider, right? So the first thing you don't do surgery or any procedure on another person that punctures the skin, harm the invaded body. So acupuncture is a surgical tool, is a surgical instrument approved by FDA. So this one doesn't really apply. Right? Technically, acupuncture is a surgery. There's only a hole instead of a laceration. And then the next thing, that's why. Some of the doctors say, oh, you cannot prescribe an x-ray. Yeah, because you don't want to prescribe x-ray radiation to another person as a therapy. Oncologist, radio oncologist, that's what they do. And the third, you know that 
light and drugs, or controlled substance. Are you familiar with the terms? Can you prescribe ibuprofen? Yes, yes you can prescribe, but a controlled drug is like a morphine, something like that. Control C1, C1, 2, 1 and 2, 3. What is light and drugs? Aspen, ibuprofen, Tylenol. Oh, okay. Yeah. Okay. So we learned, we learned at the school about nutrition, pharmacology. We know that interaction between herbs and the medicine on some other drugs, but we don't prescribe them. So when you recommend some supplements, vitamins, it will be very easy for you to say, oh, just take some ibuprofen when your pain is really out of control. But be careful, don't let their physician hear. And we know alcohol can lower blood pressure. Oh, why are you taking so, you know, so many blood pressure medicine and you're losing weight and then you have edema, uh, edema you have trouble breathing, uh, just stop taking them. You have a question? Sorry, I question about the control substance, like C1, 2, C3, the drug. Can we prescribe this medicine for the patient? No, we, are not allowed. we don't have a DEA number, okay. we, you don't have the prescription you know, authority. Okay. And then later I'll give you a couple of case studies, you will see how they run into trouble. Okay, okay. thank you. Yeah, we got control substances, including marijuana. Oh, I'm giving some herb to my patient, and you will see how they run into trouble. Okay. And then I can recommend discontinu uh, discontinuance of legend drugs. So you don't tell your patient, stop or start taking some drugs. Don't interfere with other physicians. You can always tell the patient, okay, I think uh, there's some side effect, you know, probably associated to your medication. Why don't you talk to your, you know, prescribing doctor and see what they think. Even though acupuncture and urge tell patient with a lot of different symptoms, and don't tell patient to stop their medication until they talk to their physician. You know, we have a scope of our practice, and on what condition we can treat with acupuncture herbs. And in some circumstances, uh, situation, we cannot handle the, you know, uh, the case. The patient who has mental illness, you cannot handle the case, refer them out, okay? When you buy malpractice insurance, and there's a questionnaire, they ask you, do you refer patient out? In the beginning, I didn't understand very well because my English was not that good. And I thought the patient was referred by the family doctor to me and why I had referred them back. So later I understood because the patient may need another specialist opinion. Number six, sex fractures. We should not, we shall not. Dislocation, yes. If patient has a dislocation or some uh, tear of the ligament, you can put brace on or maybe a cast on, but not when the patient has a fracture. How we can treat patient with fracture, and then there's also pain and there's swelling, but we really don't put splint or like a brace on. But sometimes if you have a patient is a very unique case, and then you have to think about how you can walk over to the edge. Uh, early this year, we had a patient, a senior lady who came from China to visit her parent, uh, her children here, and then she fell down and broke her arm. And then, in my opinion, she probably had a fracture in her forearm. So that was a Sunday afternoon. I came to the office to see her and gave her acupuncture for pain relief and then uh, swelling reduction. And then the next morning, I sent her to imaging center for X-ray, and then X-ray came back positive fracture of the radius. She didn't have insurance. She didn't want to be a patient at a hospital. So my, that's my dilemma. Should I treat her for the fracture or try to stay from, you know, away from trouble? <laughs> if the patient refused to go to any other doctors because she doesn't have insurance or she didn't, you know, didn't bother to call emergency, uh, she could have gone to an emergency, probably spent a few hours and then have a cast on, and maybe even surgeries. And that's going to be $50,000, something $30,000. She doesn't have the means to cover. So in this case, I have to think really hard. I want to be more ethical than legal. So I decided to make a cast for her and to stabilize her because it's non-displaced. I know 
the surgery is questionable, just to stabilize. I'm not saying, oh, I'm trying to set your bones, okay? Because they're not displayed, uh, you know, not displaced. Yeah. And acupuncture twice a week, and then after six weeks, and then after another x-ray, already healed. So acupuncture really works. Normally, bones start mending, but in this case, she already healed quite a bit, like 80%. Number seven, don't treat laceration operation through electrotherapy, not electrical acupuncture, okay? Oh, you understand? Like if there's an open wound, and you want to close, the wound by electrical uh, electric, electricity, like a cauterizer. But you can stick needle around the wound and then it will stop bleeding, stop the inflammation, avoid infection. So number eight is very important for our profession. Don't say no matter where you came from, what state, or what kind of degree you have, as long as you're not licensed in California, in America, as a physician, just don't say you're a physician. So very often people ask me, uh, tell me how many years in, in practice for. I would say 30 years, and then what kind of training background you have. I would say I was trained physician in China. And we know uh, most of the schools here, when they try to introduce a speaker from China, or people graduate from China, and they say physician in China, or MD in China. Technically, it's not okay. Okay, so you don't do anything of those, and you're fine. Okay, let's talk about legal thing. Um, I want to show you a website, acupuncturedwar.gov. There are many, page, uh, no, many practitioners lose their license because of legal issues. Do you ever visit acupuncturedwar website? Okay. On which part of your life the most? Hmm? You said all passing away. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, under consumer, say consumer, and there is one, the last one, you probably can, you should read, yeah. And you look at so many people having some issues with the board because they had the issue with their patients, with other boards. Well, I went through from A to H, and I saw, uh, no, A to J, okay. I saw three my, from my interns. Yeah, so it's really shocking for me to see those names, and then I believe they were a really good student in the past, and then when they became a licensed person, and they just did something you cannot even understand why. So when they have license, they feel like this is a power, is a tool, is a channel, they can get closer to more female patients, uh, more drug dealers. This is the worst thing you would like to do as a professional. I recommend that studying this section, you learn from all the cases. This is how I taught other acupuncturists. It's very important. It's very interesting information. You will learn a lot. You really improve your knowledge your understanding about the law, common sense. You will have more common sense. A lot of people really don't appreciate how hard they earn the license. They don't know how to keep that. Many people, they are sponsored by the family members. They borrow money from the government on student loan. And then in the end, they ruin their life. We have, learned, we have studied the story. It's like a case in a scenario. Very interesting. And then you, I bet you will be more fascinated than most of the novels you read. <laughs> so you do your own uh, your homework, okay? I bet you will you want to read one after another. <laughs> okay. So the top the top one is studying or prescribing herbs, marijuana. Like uh, you know, there are a lot of people in Santa Cruz. They can now we can legally grow some and or buy some and we can enjoy. But as a licensed person, a former intern who taught me surfing uh, in Santa Cruz, we were really good friends. And he often came back to my uh, continue, continue education seminars. And then just one day when I look at his uh, profile, 
post shop. And many people law, uh, lost their license, or they are losing their license because of DUI, driving under influence. Some people drinking even during the lunchtime. So I saw a few cases, Texas and San Francisco, uh, pretty much all over. Just some of them, you know, made available uh, public, some not. So there's one person in San, uh, San Francisco and had a drink during the lunch hour and then forgot the patient in the room and then locked the patient in overnight sometimes. And some patient can smile at alcohol when they return from lunch. This is a very good place to be a doctor, uh, to be an acupuncturist, quite pure if you're doing the right thing. Just work hard, study hard, and then you build your practice, and you will be rewarded. Because of the healing, because you are under radar, you are under surveillance. Be professional. If you want to be a professional, you have to continue to study to improve your skills, and then love what you do, and then do what you love. I hope the difference between acupuncture here and China just because you really love the medicine. You want to do it. The public feel I enjoy what I'm doing. Every morning I want to come to my clinic always early then I shoot. I come to my clinic I come to a show. <laughs> so if you are late for your patient, you're not professional. If the patient has serious condition and you are even delaying and you are not happy. And for my practice, for my team, anybody is late and then has to show me a reason, a good reason. Yeah. You know, probably it can be late for a couple times a year, but if you are show me a pattern, I know you are you really don't enjoy what you're doing. This is not what you should be. Yeah, I'll show you a few cases you will see in our practice, five branches, my own clinic, or some other clinics, okay? We sometimes probably busy, and now we are social media mania, right? So we are so attached to technology, LinkedIn, Facebook, and you know, Tumblr, uh, Twitter. So what's the point? So I did a lot in the past, but after all, I feel like I'm so disruptive. Stay focused. Patient first. So we have a patient who came in, and uh, the teacher has a few students. Okay, let's you know treat this patient frozen shoulder. We put cups on, and then run back to the you know like a, a lounge or maybe like an herb room. Uh, first they talk about herbs, and afterwards they talk about MBA. They talk about the presidential campaign and then they drive really long, and I forgot the patient there. 20 minutes later, they came back, oh, sorry. I know sometimes the patient has a tender skin, really delicate skin. So five minutes, this happened, and then I, we know that's reasonable. But 20 minutes, that's not reasonable. Um, there are many licensed acupuncturists really don't know how to do acupuncture. But they pass the board, they are specialists for herbs. So they don't know how to use acupuncture, how patient, so they don't want to use herbs. Okay. Many patients, he uh, is not know how to use it. He is because he is using drugs. So this is a patient who had a sprained ankle, a high school, high school uh, basketball player, sprained the ankle, and then saw an acupuncture who just gave some herbal paste without doing any physical, physical exam, and then just put herbal paste on. Three, four days, okay, just stay home and you'll be fine. Three, four days later, the patient has even more pain. So leaking was torn. The patient probably needs surgery. And the patient has strong reaction to the earth. I, I think uh, if you can dim the light here, you see the real case. When I first saw this patient, this is much better already. So huge patch of blisters. So this test was on my YouTube channel showing anterior drawer test for ATF, anterior total fibular ligament tear. So I did the test and then confirmed there's tear and then refer the patient back to the family doctor and the family doctor will call for another specialist and then just make sure the patient doesn't need surgical you know, intervention. On my YouTube channel, there's another case, the father of this son
you can search <laughs> you can check out and because I did my physical exam and the confrontation has hair and I made a proper uh, appropriate referral and then the mother and the father were kind of impressed oh but you're different from other doctors <laughs> and then I looked at her his father and he was sitting in the chair uh, I was easy that day I said okay um, uh, looks like you have a torn ligament in your knee wow uh, you even you haven't even touched my knee you know that because he had the south of the sun and like the, the knee is sinking so showing the insufficiency of the ligament so the father eventually was treated by me and I got relieved but I told him you need to go back to a surgeon and then order MRI confirm my diagnosis you have ACL tear and then instability causes pain inflammation so that's why the pain comes and goes his right. family doctor diagnosed like a tendonitis and then told a couple other acupuncture this patient has a tendonitis in me okay try acupuncture but nobody could help his, uh, his case yeah. right. Uh, this is also from ice burn. So cold pack also can burn the skin. Okay. Not only hot. Now, this patient was seeing PT and who used the ice pack for too long. And uh, burn the skin. Okay, I can counter how heal really fast. Okay. So patient has back pain, shoulder pain, they'll be using the ice and then it's gonna only gets worse. Okay. So you can help patient with the pain and then in this case the eye counter you know, also help the ulcer heal faster. The patient sometimes came in, oh, young deficiency, very cold, like the patient has a hypothyroidism, and then you want to, you know, patient want to relax and want to, you know, uh, feel comfortable on the table, so you put a hidden lamp, are uh, you warm enough? Oh, I don't feel the heat, I don't feel the heat, and then you get closer and closer. Be careful, one patient has diabetes, a patient has stroke, and they're sensitive, there's sensitive loss. So if you're using heating lamp, be careful and it may burn the patient. We had a case, an older patient had the arm barbecued by a heating lamp. Don't let this happen to you. We see one that you said that And the patient sometimes is very sensitive, the skin is very sensitive. And then a lot of doctors say, okay, I do eye powder and I give you some herbal plaster. So be careful, ask patient if their, if their skin is sensitive. Okay, okay. Uh, the next couple of cases will be very personal. Okay. Uh, if you look at this picture, you see the patient has a really swollen finger, right? A lady patient came in you know, to my sports medicine internship and some one of my intern. And I went to Santa Cruz campus. This is a Santa Cruz is the after two sessions, patient, you know, the patient fell down and sprained the finger two weeks ago, and then now feeling better. However, the range of motion doesn't improve, uh, improve very much. And my opinion is, if the, in, you know, the pain is reduced, the range of motion should continue in as well. So I decided to go into the room with my intern and examine the patient's finger, and uh, I feel like the patient has a ankylosis, like the, there's frozen finger. I decided to tell the patient you need to take an uh, x-ray to confirm there are no bone damage or dislocation something. Okay, to be professional, I would tell the patient, okay, you need to take x-ray and my patient said, I'm doing much better, so I don't have to because I don't have insurance. I said, this is gonna help us make decisions because you are not making progress as we would like to see. So I told the patient, I know you like us, if you want to continue this, see us, and then you follow my order. If you don't, and then I'm going to refer you out. So eventually they went for x-ray and they came back. It was too late to set, you know, to re reduce the joint. Yeah, so she ended up with a, uh, with a surgery. And then a month later, she sent me a letter, ordered my documentation, my uh, chart. Because she found out at the parking lot of a shopping mall, now she had a lawyer, and then she wanted me to support her case. So we're not sure what's going on. You'd rather order than not. Because I've been doing this for 30 years, sometimes I became more arrogant, too confident. 
here I also want to uh, make a point. When we study acupuncture, we have so many things that you have to be really cautious about. Like a pregnancy, do you treat pregnancy? Do you treat patient who has pain when they're pregnant? So this is a patient who is pregnant, as you can see, right? Uh, she has severe back pain and she wants help. She called two other acupuncturists and finally the second one told me, I told her, you know, we don't want to help you uh, because you know it's too scary, okay? We cannot help you. It's not we don't help you. We want to help you, but we cannot because it's too dangerous. <laughs> Uh, they, so the second one was my former intern, and she was a lawyer before, <laughs> before she became an acupuncturist. How many months pregnancy for this woman? Uh, eight. Eight months? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. You know, if I just do a few additional points, and the patient, it doesn't feel really enough relief. And then ask me if you do, uh, if you do anything, you know, like cupping uh, needles locally here, so this is dilemma again. <laughs> so I told my patient, don't be too greedy. <laughs> uh, but you know, after some discipline, you feel like there's local inflammation or muscle really tight. You can do some soft tissue work and then still not enough. You feel like I should needle in the lower back. <laughs> so in my opinion, this is her third pregnancy already. And then she's already reached eight months or seven, eight months. I can feel the more trust between me and my patient. So the distance between your, uh, you and your patient is you measure between the heart. Your patient asks me to help with her back pain, and then I tell her, no, it's too so dangerous, I'm going to lose my license. It makes me feel uncomfortable, like it doesn't sound very ethical. <laughs> so eventually I treat her just like, you know, without even thinking she's pregnant. I, would, you know, I didn't use a lot of stimulation, I didn't, you know, do really, uh, you know, more than you know, normal. Yeah. So I found her really, and the cupping really helped her through her, you know, deep, very difficult pregnancy. Yeah. So I want to use the to help you guys rethink about what we learned from school, from the old literature. <laughs> and then this raises another question. The guns and needles. So the needles and the guns are all different now. So those are, I think we know a few points in lower abdomen and if you needle will cause infertility, right? Mm -hmm. That's what we learned, you know, that was written in the book. Mm -hmm. And how big the needle we had before? It's time to rewrite the textbook. It's not scientifically supported. Okay. There's no proof. There's no proof needling those points will cause miscarriage. There are some patients who are diabetic, they are using insulin shot, and they are needling their you know, own body every day. Why does it cause miscarriage? Okay. And if that this happened, and then what did the doctor say? Because you just, you know, the baby, the video was not a good one, not strong enough. And I'm going to start doing something with this textbook. So I think it's time to remove research our scope of practice and then really block access to the medicine for a lot of people. That's like the guns, you know, like a year ago, you know, a long time, 200 years ago, they got only a little one shot and they reload and now the gun is so much different and so much powerful. So we need that control. It's time to say no to the new technology, but we should have green light for the new needles. Some insurance, malpractice insurance, don't even cover pregnancy. If you're seeing pregnancy, sorry, we don't cover it. Uh, you do a labor promotion. So it's time to think about how we can clear up the roadblocks to our you know, profession, you know, our, you know, our practice. So we need some time, more courage, more wisdom. To be a good one, to be more professional, to be a more competent doctor, sometimes think outside the box be more creative, and also you walk over the edge. Seeing so many patients for so many years, and then there are always some conditions, you know, situations, you probably feel kind of a little difficult, challenging to deal with. I have the courage, I have the, you know, the creative thinking, and then I develop a condition, and like a technique, of a muscle channel technique. Uh -huh. 
Yeah, it, the special technique for eye trauma, I often return needles for patient for pain relief, for longer pain relief, yeah. And then I saw a little girl who came in with a sprained toe because she was jumping on the trampoline and then her toe got a little stuck. And the sprained, bruised, and then came to see me. And that happened two weeks before her spring camp. I treated her three or four times. She felt much better, and then she was able to do PE, and then she was able to run. And uh, she, her mother asked me, can she go to camp? Oh, she looks fine in the gym. Yeah, go ahead. And then about a month later, her mom came to my office. Uh, I want to see the chart, and then I told you, I want to tell you, my daughter had a fracture in her toe. Uh, now we are seeing a specialist. A specialist recommended, not surgery, but she needs like a bone stimulator. Tell me. Okay, if you were the doctor on site, and then please share with me, how would you feel? A patient walk to your office and then ask you, uh, and then give you the information. How will you react? What kind of reaction you may have? I'm probably ashamed. Yeah, I felt very, very, you know, embarrassed. Okay, I just asked the mom, okay, what I can do for you. So I went to my mom, what can I do for you? You know, we know you're a good doctor, and, uh, um, but you know, this really caused inconvenience to our life. And we have high deductible, they pay cash to see me. And then we have high deductible insurance. And then now we are seeing a specialist, and we also need this bone stimulator, and the insurance will now cover until up, you know, after the first five thousand dollars. So I didn't know how much the bone stimulator would cost, but I know it's going to be a lot of money involved. But at that moment, it was not important anymore. And then I just feel like embarrassed, and then I should have done better. And not for me, it's for the profession. I was overconfident. See, MCT, that's really a miracle. The patient feel better, and they can go back <laughs> to activity. Mm -hmm. So looking back, it may not be my fault. You know, the patient may not have the fracture at the time, and the patient, you know, just happened, probably something happened on the, you know, the treat, you know. But no matter what, I should have our x-ray to make sure there was no fracture before she left. I look at her chart again, and I realize she has been taking, she was an asthmatic patient that's been on steroids for many years. And that was another factor, you know, I should have considered. What was more embarrassing, when I gave my note to them, it was a fourth toe, second lot, fourth, number four, fourth toe. And then my intern wrote down, first toe. <laughs> we don't call first toe, we call big toe, or great toe. <laughs> But when I told my intern what happened, and then he didn't hear clearly, oh, first of all, bad English. So I was, I was very embarrassed, I sent a letter to my patient, and then I was ready to take care of anything that may happen here. I feel very bad, so I sent a letter to my patient, and I was ready to take care of anything that may happen here. At the time, I was going through a very personal, difficult time. I was, so when you are in stress, and then your judgment will be affected. I found my excuse, my reason. <laughs> we are human beings. <laughs> but I still want to express my embarrassment, you know, uh, my bad feeling. And what I did write, the writing I did, I was very responsive, I was very responsible. So eventually the patient, the family, were forgiving, and then they didn't report, they didn't make a big thing, oh, you know, you know, Zhong Yi is bad, you know, t doctor, not good, and, you know, mess up my daughter's case, yeah. So I need to order two, you know, views for the x-ray. So this is the check, the, you know, the check, reimbursement check I gave the patient. Oh, this is a wall, wall. It was only 2600. It was such a relief for me to know the number. <laughs> no malpractice involved, you know, involved. 
the page is very reasonable, very forgiving. So you saw that one picture, one picture worth thousand words. And this now, the equation is one picture worth thousand dollars. <laughs> It's a good lesson, and then it's well, very well worth. So sometimes you run in trouble, still play like a pro, be professional, be ethical. It's okay to say sorry. If we want, in Chinese, we say "I'm sorry." I like to play like a like a pro, so you know I'm a qualified medical violator, like QME. So this is medical legal uh, work I do, and then this is a, a report. I wrote. I, you know, we should avoid trouble in the future, but it does happen from time to time, and then we are humans. Yeah. So it happens, we should take care of that. Adequately, professional. I think my one report can cover a couple such things, but I hope that's the only thing. That's the last thing you want to see. In our medical profession, it's very hard for a doctor to say sorry. And I did some, you know, why I have got the courage to say sorry, to write a letter to a patient, and then eventually we settle the case really happily. Because I read a lot, and I look for help, assistance. I read over time. So read more. Okay, I'll give another case. Uh, April 1st and the 2nd, I was here. Uh, just a few more minutes. Okay. Uh, Any extra meaning? Uh, okay. Is it okay right now? Yeah. I saw a case here. Uh, an athlete who came to see me for Shen Springs. And then eventually she came to my office to see me for her change place. So I did MCT retention of the needles and uh, she felt much better. And one morning, Saturday, uh, Monday morning, she sent me a text message. Uh, I think one of the needles stuck in my leg. How do you feel? How do you respond? <laughs> How do you react? <laughs> Broken needle. Well, well, it happened in my 30 year practice only once. When I did a start of acupuncture, thrusting, thrusting, and then the handle broke out. And I was able to find a tweezer, use a tweezer to take the broken needle off. When things happen like this, and then you ask, where's the other half needle, right? <laughs> other patients sent me a picture, and then also text message. Uh, this is what I found, but I don't think this is a needle that came out from my body. Okay, I told her, come to my office right away. So I went to my office, eight. I knew there was no broken needle, only bent needle. She only lost the needle. But she has fear. And then she showed me some bruise, or slight bruise. This is my own needle. I have my two needles here, UV channel, GB channel, within two weeks. And I do martial art, and one time I got a kick. And then this is what happens. You can do experiment. Wiggle the needle probably a hundred times, it may break. So that's under normal circumstances. So almost impossible or unlikely to have a broken needle. Unless a sharp object cut through. Uh, but I tell my patient, come to my office and outer x ray and then rule out. Because that's a peace of mind for me and for you as well. However, the patient didn't go to uh, go, go to imaging center. So it happened on Monday morning, and then Friday, I asked her, "I need an update." Oh, no needle. <laughs> <laughs> and I was really mad. My emotions. I was really mad, and not because you know she didn't tell me because she is going to be my intern she want to be a doctor in the future she want to come to my office to intern with me in the summertime i told her i was more concerned than you could imagine because i can uh, that night i wrote her long email i taught her lesson you should have responded more professionally 
She also wrote me a long, e even longer email. I apologize. <laughs> Very, but now I'm coaching her. <laughs> so it's okay to say sorry. Yeah. Uh, we're not, you know, we're a human being. We're not perfect, so it's okay. And if you did something wrong, and then take out the mistake, and then try to avoid in the future. Okay, if there is a real case of broken needle, it's still not end of the world. Okay, surgery, I take it out. A small part probably doesn't really affect people's life. And then this is a patient now who came to me for shoulder pain because he had broken needle in his shoulder, a real suture needle. The suture needle broke. And then they couldn't find where it is, and then they couldn't do a surgery to open up and find it. They said, too difficult, just live with that. Uh, a patient came to see me, uh, well, give me some relief, okay, do my best. <laughs> but there's a needle walking around, you know, poking, and then there's always some pain. And then he consulted the lawyer, and the lawyer said, well, this is a small case. I need case less than a million. <laughs> They're not interested. Okay. <laughs> today. It's very unlikely to have broken needle with high amount of practice. And uh, in any case, something happened and be calm and uh, call around and get advice. Don't panic. Okay? I hope my case helped you feel better. <laughs>